everyone, welcome to my channel for game number 5 of ETC 2024 for uh, myself and Team Switzerland. We are facing Team Ukraine uh, at the start of day 3. So as a reminder, after disappointing day 1 where we capped one time, we got capped by Italy. Then day 2, we got close to a draw against USA which was disappointing uh, regarding what we wanted to reach. After that we got a gap against Finland which uh, helps us uh, climb the ladder a little bit and then we have a game against Ukraine before the last game which uh, could still be an opportunity for us to play for the podium so we're trying to reach maximum of point here uh, we know that uh, Ukraine is a solid top 10 team so it's not going to be easy and I was paired against uh, their KOE player so let's uh, have a look at uh, about his list if you recall on my channel, you, uh, I have, you should have seen a battle report that I did before ETC, which was a training game against the scrub list, scrub KOE list, which was uh, quite special. I wanted to get uh, a taste about how it works, what are the combo, the tricks and so on. And I was very happy to get that training because this one is maybe a copy paste or at least very, very similar, but I would say copy paste of the, the scrub list. So we find again the double trebuchet, we find again the block of infantry, uh, one two, one cheap, one more expensive. Then we have three knight units here, and then the amount of small cheap characters. We have two paladin, the folk hero, then we have the queen, provides some magic and shooting. We have the duke BSB, and we have damsel apprentice that can also be a piece of chaff, is on foot. And then the naiad providing some more magic and outlaws for the queen to be in it. So basically, yeah, I think it's more or less a scrub list. I would say uh, uh, most likely exactly the same. And uh, really happy to have got this training before playing this game because this helped me realizing, uh, if you recall what I took, what I said at the, at the end of my training game, which was, it's a very dangerous game. It's a very dangerous matchup for me because if the trebuchet got some hits early on, um, I could be in big trouble with my block to be able, basically my capability of holding the charges would be in danger after I got a couple of trebuchet hits. That's basically the, the things that scared me the most about this matchup. We were playing uh, Breaking Flag on a uh, Breakthrough and below you have the spell selection. Matchup analysis, so yeah, I played against it. I know that the matchup is very dangerous uh, for me basically. Like I said, if the trebuchet hit me early on, any of my block, maybe except the bastion, which is slightly different, but uh, it would need a bit more shooting to really reduce me enough. But then I will be in danger from breaking from any cavalry charge. So Lugas, um, the unit of Vlandabas in the core and so on could be in danger. Even the bastion, if he hits me a couple of times, then any charge could break me easily. So it's very scary and that's the main reason why I didn't like the variance around the matchup. It's not a, a 6 that I put in the matrix in the sense I would be, I think it can, yeah, it's, it's, it's more to just to sum it up about the danger and the variance is for me the negative variance, meaning I don't have huge win potential here. It's quite complicated, I have to play it quite defensively. He has an advantage on the secondary because he's going to push towards me. So he's going to get the pressure and get to my deployment zone where is it going, it's going to be harder for me to reach his deployment zone. So I think just the secondary is not in my favor. And then the variance, I mean, if he hits me a couple of times with the trebuchet, then uh, it can get very dangerous and he could potentially uh, beat me heavily. So I didn't like at all the matchup, but uh, that was one of the choice that we made later on in the pairing to get some positive matchups, so I took out one from the team, so to say. Uh, I got the only very negative matchup in the pairing, the rest was quite positive, so I was okay with that. And uh, we will see how that goes. So on the second objective, I will try, I have one more scoring unit than him, so I will try to play compact and uh, try to get one of his with range damage, potentially shooting a magic can do a lot. Deployment, so I think, yeah, very interesting here. Uh, to talk about it. So I win the roll for side. I gave him the impossible splitting his deployment zone in a one third, two third, we could say. So this is going, is, this is going to give him a choice to make. Uh, I analyzed that on the left flank. I have a very interesting piece of terrain, which is wall. And then we have a hill also that could play to my advantage. So he's going to very smartly realize that uh, dropping for first turn could be dangerous for him because if you go too heavily on the left, I would go on the right and the opposite is also valid. 
So he want to see where I go. So he elects to, he tell me to start drop. I'm going to start with a giant. He's going to respond uh, with a unit of Realm Knight here. Then I'm going to place Chalk Anointed on the left because I thought already that he might go heavy right due to the Realm Knight being here. So I felt, okay, left could be my way to go. So I place Anointed here. He's going to answer with Knight of the Court. And that's enough for me. At this point of time, I told him, okay, I'm going to elect to drop everything for the first turn. Because basically, I know that I can target this unit. If I get it, uh, that's a scoring unit. Uh, so after that, he has only one, two, he had five total, yeah, like me. Three, four. So if I can kill one, I need only four of, out of my five to reach his deployment zone here to make the breakthrough. So um, my deployment is then uh, Lugas here, then we have the Overlord, we have the Vassal Levies, we have Infernal Warrior, we have the Bastion and the Incarnate in an unusual central position. They are here to delay him, to zone him. They are dangerous against any cavalry unit, especially if I do some range damage. So I felt that could be a decent position for them. I could have also placed them all the way to the right, but I felt I would struggle to give him an uh, incendiary token. But that could also have been a possibility for me. So basically that's it about my deployment and then I think on his side he has two options uh, and I was really curious to see what he was going to do because he could have potentially deployed everything in the left flank here in this corner and go and face me in the front. So let's go for frontal fight but I think due to the train combination here it would have been too risky for him because my bastion can easily turn one, go into a position distracting behind the wall and then good luck to charge me plus the Cadim Incarnate here supporting around. So I think that's going to be a strong combination. Then the Overlord with 14 can easily go behind the hill. And then it's very threatening with fly position over his backline in case it tries to start to push. And those Lugars can also easily uh, push behind the hill uh, without being seen by a second unit. So only one unit would see me. So I can get into good position starting the, the turn. So basically he's not sure to go through me and uh, this is going to be a high variance matchup. He elected to go on the opposite flank. He plays the expensive infantry, cheap infantry, realm, trebuchet, trebuchet, general and the naiad and here you have the enlisted outlaw together with the queen on uh, the left of the impassable. So we are just after deployment we have a quick, uh, we, I see my coach going through, I think he's, he was quite happy, at least I was quite, quite happy about the macro. I felt on a macro level I already gained some points, I already placed myself in a situation where I should be able to get something closer to a 10. So I'm already starting to raise my estimation of the matchup because I felt the rush is now is coming from a long part, I can get into strong position using the wall and then push my breakthrough uh, over the left and use the overlord in a zone where I have space and I should be able to catch this unit to try to kill them. Basically that will be my main goal. If I achieve that. I will win secondary. So I have a bit of margin even if he hit me with trebuchet and then my most sensitive infantry is all the way here to the left meaning very far away from his uh, realm bus which is the main threat for me. So I felt I have a bit of time, uh, it's not that bad and on the right I have the giant as a nuisance piece, uh, I, I don't know if it's the correct word in English but to be very annoying to push to the flank to create something in his backline in case he pushed too hard here on the left I can create something with the giant here, so he needs to take the giant into account. Uh, that's also always something very important to keep in mind. When somebody is going to play aggressive against you, try to not only defend in a corner and wait until he catches you, but try to offer some other point of distraction, of uh, aggression, potential aggression, counter-aggression, just to make your opponent uh, have to consider mul the multiple options you, you could take during his aggressive move, and I think he, this is key. Let's move on to my turn one. So I uh, push on the left, start to establish a battle line. Um, I uh, go with my giant on the hill in a position to zone a little bit. The ID is still the same. I don't want him to be able to push too quickly here because he would expose his flank to me. So that would be hard and the same for the infantry. So that's the ID. The overlord takes an aggressive position. He doesn't see me due to the hill, so I take that into account. He could charge my Lugar. I have the Overlord with a line of sight, so if he charges me, I would see from the second rank, so he would need to reform really wide. And I have also those guys that can move in between for the counter charge. So I'm well set up, uh, starting to be aggressive on the left. Here I don't leave him any long charge, obviously. 
and the Bastion moves into position to start to do some damage, but we are really far away. He completely minimizes uh, what I might do with the Bastion, so I have not so many things at track uh, right now. In the magic phase, I got Rot Within on this infantry, uh, give them minus one weapon skill that could matter later in the game, and then he dispels the breast weapon that I tried to give on my Overlord to cast because I was able to see the back of the unit. Try to get on them a uh, toxic breast, which would have been really, really interesting, but he saw that coming. Let's move on to his turn, so he start to push. As you can see, battle line, this unit for me is the main threat. They have a lot of ranks, so I need to reduce them as soon as possible. Uses the paladin to uh, block my giant. I cannot charge him. I think he does multi wound two against me. Very, way too dangerous. But I'm continuing to, I will continue to do cat and mouse and occupy the paladin. If he's tr using him to defend, it's not a piece that is going to attack me here in the flank. So I'm quite happy about that. A left flank, he find a position where I don't see him anymore. And this is a quite long charge. If I fail it, I cannot chaff him and then he can punish me with a charge and kill the overlord most likely. So not so interesting for me. Um, let's move on to the magic phase. I dispel Raven's Wing. He failed reroll to hit on a big version. I think he wanted to get that um, on a trebuchet, maybe on both. I don't know if it works, but I think that was his ID. Scrying fail as well, so not so successful, but he got plus one resilience on this infantry here. And uh, Trebuchet, I think, didn't hit me this turn, so um, that was a good start. Maybe he got an indirect, but nothing significant. My turn two. So I start to, to wheel towards the left, the incarnate, uh, continue to move uh, here, I think maybe sideways or back, but start to defend. I find uh, aggressive position here with Overlord, which is uh, maybe on the 12, but very far away. Uh, the giant failed the march check, but still goes out of arc to uh, threaten him, threaten, threaten his advance, and force the paladin to move back in front of me, which is the idea. Uh, then I place my uh, bastion within 18 to start to do wounds on the realm, which are the main threat, and the rest start to push towards the left. Here I'm blocking any line of sight, he cannot move out, uh, he doesn't see me. I move here those guys in the middle to provide potential counter charge. He could charge me here in the front, but I see him with two units to counter charge, so that's way too dangerous for him right now. So quite happy, and what I like about that is the Overlord has a line of sight on this trebuchet, meaning the trebuchet are the variants in the matchup that I didn't like, like I told you, he didn't do anything in the turn one. So here I'm thinking either he needs to move the trebuchet on his turn two and doesn't shoot, or he stays like that, and then on my turn three I can charge trebuchet, kill him, and then reform and be here or in his back line looking at him. So I'm feeling, okay, that's a great option. Then I can maybe go for the second trebuchet or I can go for a unit. This forces him to also take into consideration the potential charges from the Overlord on this part of the map here. So yeah, thinking the Overlord is in a, in a great position to, to provide threat for him. Magic phase, get a Grave Cold, kill three of the court of the Rail Knight in the big boss. That's very nice. And I fail uh, Rot Within on one dice. His turn two uh, gives me a front here in case I want to charge. Uh, he's uh, got the court to counter charge me in the back. Okay, um, what else do we have? We have the court pushing toward the middle. I think maybe they fail the march check. I don't know if we were within eight, but it just marched towards here, leaving me with an 11 on the charge, I would say. Very far. The anointed doesn't see him, so that's fine for him. Uh, I start to push the realm out of my line of sight. Uh, that's the problem with the Incarnate, I knew that maneuverability would be an issue and he exploits that very effectively with two units threatening me here in the down part of the map. Um, and you see the realm have been a bit depleted, so that's uh, good news for me, at least. In the magic phase, he got uh, distracting in aura, hot target, and I dispelled the fly move and he, I dispelled the heal as well, so I was successful in dispelling it. Phase. This time I think he got a shot uh, on some unit, did some wound, but uh, nothing crazy I remember. Uh, my turn three, so a uh, couple of uh, important moments. I elected, uh, since here I was way, well blocked by, uh, by his move because if I charge here, he has the Paladin as a counter charge, so basically I cannot take that one. If I charge here, he can counter charge me with the court in the back, which would be uh, very problematic. So I just went for the trebuchet, 
and if I reform here, I'm out of charge range of anything. So I was happy with that to just deny him uh, more shooting until he does a lot. Uh, I went here into a position pushing forward. I didn't take this charge. I think it was, like I said, 11, 12 was a long charge. No matter what, I didn't take it. It was not rollable. We can discuss about that. Uh, potentially, I should have taken it. I think if I make it, uh, that's huge. Uh, taking a scoring, being in a nice zone with the Lugas. So that could have been an option, but I felt it's just too long charge. I could have also potentially, we will see the, the way I reform. I, I think I just push forward here in a position where I'm threatening for him. And then the anointed went over there to uh, block the left flank and prepare the breakthrough. That was also my idea. I push with the Bastion to be within 12 of them. I'm going to shoot at those guys. And I have also those guys shooting here, being on the out of line of sight, I would say. So get a good amount of shot at the court. Uh, they are not protected by anything for magic. Uh, so that's quite interesting. In the meantime, the incarnate are uh, blocked. There is nothing I can do if I move back. He could charge me in the flank, overrun into the Bastion. It's way too dangerous, so I'm just going to sacrifice them, push them forward to chaff this unit here. And we will see what he does. The giant continue to play around, goes over, over here. And the overlord charge here, like I told you. And uh, the magic phase, I got on the... I don't remember what was that. I got something on the castle knight, some, uh, some magic on them, but I wouldn't recall. I got breast weapon also on. And between the breast weapon and all my shot, I only kill four uh, court knight. So he's still alive with like three model is fine for the panic check. So that's all good. Uh, the overlord's going to kill the tribution reform. And that's about it. He's turn three. Uh, obviously he charged into my incarnate here. Uh, I was I made sure that he has no overrun. And here I wasn't too careful. He was just able with a relentless banner exactly to move out of line of sight of the bastion, which is uh, yeah. Frustrating, I didn't check it, I should have, and uh, this is a big mistake because he can move past me towards the deployment zone, and this was easily avoidable for me, so yeah, I was frustrated by that mistake at the time, I could tell. Uh, here, like you see, my reform with the Lugars is not so good because basically he's able to escape my line of sight easily, go into a nice spot, and this is a long charge for the anointed, so. I could have angled a bit less just to be in position to propose a rollable charge from the hill, from the Lugas as well. So again, not so happy about what I did. I wanted to provide counter charge as well. So maybe that was one of the reasons why in case the court would charge me. But I think I have enough bodies to resist. I think I was maybe that those guys, I didn't want him to charge me, but I think I was potentially out of line of sight. So he could only charge the Bastion in the front, I would say. So I think that was acceptable. I should have angle the Lugar differently. So some mistake here on the left part of the map, another mistake with the Bastion. So that's all a uh, couple of costly mistakes, we could say. Um, what else? Yeah, still the Paladin chaffing me, those guys moving toward the deployment zone, everything going south, which is bad news for me. Magic face, he got minus one, plus one resilience on his infantry. Uh, he got, I dispelled the big fly move. He got hard target on the cavalry. Uh, he hit me with trebuchet, kill 8 of my infernal warrior, which doesn't matter that much anymore, to be honest. And we are in, during this turn 3, we are on a point of time, I think I discussed about that with him. I think it's interesting to mention it, um, because there is no bad blood, we had a good explanation about that, but we had time issues. In this game, I will show you at the end, uh, I track the time, all my ETC game, and I will show you at the end of my battle reports in the conclusion video all the tracking of the, the time but in this battle I put it at the end also because I think it's quite interesting uh, to, to discuss it um, in, a, in an open way and no, no bad feeling like I said basically what happened is at the beginning I think during my turn 3 I tell him uh, we are going to struggle with time so multiple times I told him we need to play a bit faster and basically, um, both of us, huh? I, I was also at the, this time, I didn't uh, count it exactly how much time we both play, but I just checked quickly and I see he made a couple of more minutes than me, but nothing crazy. And I told him we need to play faster. I want at least to play a five turn. You agree with that? Yes. Okay, fine. So that's during turn three. And now uh, during my turn four, during my movement phase, uh, he asked me, um, we don't have much time left. I propose you we finish on this turn and for some reason 
I was making my movement and I told him yes. I don't know why, to be honest, because I knew that I needed to score uh, another two turn to put all my five scoring units in his deployment zone. I need two turn of movement. That's also the reason why uh, I wanted at least to play five turn because I know it's just a question of time, whether or not I can win the secondary since we are playing avoidance this game. So that's quite a, a key question. And we are, um, so we are during the turn four, my turn four, he asked me that. I told him yes. So we are at the beginning then uh, during the turn four at a key moment um, in his turn where we need to decide because the problem is we still have a lot of time and not much to do to be honest because we are avoiding ourselves just a couple of movements and a bit of magic shooting but it goes really fast actually and we, we are yet to decide if we play turn four and in that case he can win the secondary because he can easily put four scoring units in my deployment zone and me only three, or if you play turn five, and then I win it because I can play five scoring units in his deployment zone. So it's a bit of an issue um, of uh, communication because one time we agree something, another time something else, we are, we are a bit of a mix. We call the judge, we discuss about it. Um, they ask us what proposition, what proposition do you make? We discuss about it. I just try to explain to the judge that in my opinion, since we have easily the time to play a fifth turn, it would be very frustrating to, to stop now. And they let us try to find a solution. And then the solution, I think, was proposed by his coach at the end, if I remember correctly, uh, that on a four plus, we would play five turn. And on a one, two, three, we would play only four turn. So it was like a common ground solution in middle of both what we wanted. I want turn five, he won't turn four. We both have argument for it, so we roll a four plus. I take my Swiss dice and roll a six. So in the end, yeah, obviously I was happy, was disappointed. I still believe that it was right since we have time to play as much as we can because it's a game played that's supposed to be played in six turn. And I think to be honest, we could have even played a six turn because it went really, really fast. We finish um, still a couple of minutes before and it, at the end it was just going fast. So. Yeah, it would have been frustrating for me, but I could have handled the situation better. Definitely my mistake, and I apologize to my opponent in case he watches the video. I shouldn't have agreed on turn four after we already agreed on turn five. I think you should stick to what you agree first. If you agree to play fifth turn, then make it happen. And I think in this case, it was we did it. So it was not a problem at all. Uh, even if you don't finish all the phases and the detail, for example, the last uh, shooting phase or magic phase on the night of the court, I didn't do it. Uh, I didn't do it because, yeah, uh, we didn't have the time or we, we just said, okay, we, we ju I just do the movement and then we stop there. But basically, you don't need to do everything, but just try to play it the way it's supposed to be. And for me, a good example is the secondary objective because it's easy here to see. I just need to, like, one second, push my unit, that's it, fin end of the game. So that's how we solve it at the end. So I apologize to my opponent. I shouldn't have agreed to turn four after we agreed already. And at the end, we had to find a middle solution. I was lucky enough to win the role for, for that. But uh, like I said, for me, it was the most logical solution since we had time to play. So I think when you have time to play, you, you're, supposed, you're supposed to play. Anyway, that's enough talk about the negotiation. Uh, obviously, it's not the best part of ETC. You don't like to see opponent disappointing about stuff like that. But like I said, that my situation turn four, I mean turn five, I just need to do that. It's one second and then I have all my scoring unit in the zone. So on my turn four, I just went into shooting. I kill all except one. Uh, pass the panic check. He's going to hide. Uh, here I make a couple of charges. He fled both. He's going to rally both. Uh, he fled with both in the deployment zone, I guess. And he's going to rally with both in the deployment zone as well. Uh, he could have gone in no matter what, so that was a nice strategy. And that's how we ended up. So at the end, like I said, it was, it was really fast. It was just about just uh, moving and stuff. So nothing more happened. Like I said, I didn't send any charges. I didn't do the last magic phase on this guy. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, to be honest. Uh, obviously, I could have got a couple of little points. I would have maybe done some slightly different thing, but the same for him. So I think in this case, uh, it makes sense that we, we stop like that. So it was a perfect 10 10 on points, and then I get to win the secondary, which makes it a 13 7. Uh, here, just for information, I think it's interesting uh, the, the tracking of the time. So, like you see, nothing crazy, just had plus 9 minutes over the 3 turn. I don't know why I took 25 minutes for turn 2 and 3. That's crazy long in my standard. Should have been max 20, max, max, max. So I definitely wasted time. He did also very long. 
a bit longer than me. I think, yeah, like I said, uh, just for me, learnings in this regard, agree one time on which turn you're going to finish and then stick to that. And second point is uh, measure the time. And then if you have played less time than your opponent, I think it's a good argument to, to be able to, to stress him a bit more and try to agree on the turn and stuff like that. So yeah, a couple of learnings to try to avoid the situation because I think it's not the type of situation that we like in the game because one of us is going to be frustrated no matter what. In this case, it was him. If I would have lost the, the role, it would have been me. And it's six points in the balance, so it's, it's huge. Anyway, let's uh, come back to the game analysis. Once I saw one uh, flag, one secondary unit, I dropped for it. So I think on a macro level, I started the game better than him, I would say, uh, in, my, in my opinion at least. Compact deployment, he had two choices. He elected to go opposite flank and to focus on the secondary. Turn two Infernal Dwarfs. Yeah, getting, getting especially the Overlord into threatening position was, was nice for me. I knew that I could target the trebuchet. I think here also worth mentioning, he didn't get a lot of trebuchet hits on the first two turns, which I think is definitely key in the matchup. I think it changed a lot if he gets uh, like two hits on the Bastion, turn one and two over his shot, I think it's a huge difference in the matchup. So I was lucky enough to not suffer that. And after that, I kill one and the other one did some damage, but didn't matter anymore. Turn three, Infernal Dwarf. Yeah, suboptimal placement. I was very disappointing of my magic phase. The Court Knight able to escape. Uh, the Relentless Banner moving past the Bastion. So that's stupid mistakes. And uh, I don't know why I did those mistakes. I was just not yeah, careful enough. Please and the rallies strategy work for KOE to escape the charges of the Overlord. Turn 4 or 5, yeah, I talk enough about it. I think it's interesting to talk about it for you to learn from my mistake, from my learnings, and try to avoid you to be in this, in this type of situation because, like I said, it's never the best to end up in those kind of situations. So it's better to talk about it openly, quickly enough. I think here for me, helping a lot is tra getting track of the time. I saw that we were not going to be able to finish that we had long turn, so that's why I start to talk about it quickly enough with my opponent and at least we could avoid a very problematic situation and we ended up finding a solution which was not the best solution for both of us, so I think uh, we should have stick, just stick to what you, you said at the beginning, that would be my learning here. Uh, the round, yeah, my six points were very important because moving my estimation from six to a 13 was a huge plus for our uh, our score, definitely huge impact on the 90 we managed to reach. As you can see from the pairing, we got, yeah, like three drawish, I would say, four positive and one big negative. But like I showed you, I was able to, to make something of the matchup. And here, I would like to highlight the big difference between the matchup number one uh, that I lost 20 0 against the Beast Herd and this one. Both are not the same type of matchup. Obviously, the Beast Herd, I think, is more negative than this one and more dangerous, definitely. But still, uh, it's still a negative matchup, this one, and it's still a matchup that, with the proper training, because I played the matchup before, I knew what were my weakness, what I need to be careful about, if I can take the frontal fight, what are my strengths, for example, the Overlord, and so on. So I knew everything about the matchup and how I can play it at my best. And I think that was huge uh, for me to be able to get a good macro and quickly climb the, the points. So I think that's already a huge difference. Uh, coming back to the scores, so as you can see, we get close to our estimation in a lot of tables. There is just one table that went really bad for us. It's the Warrior, which was on a positive matchup against their uh, Sylvan Elf that was able to win 18. So huge win for them. The rest, uh, is, it was really close result and a couple of uh, good results for us. Uh, 17 here, then a couple of 13, 12, 13, 13, 11. So close round. We had one big win, they had a big loss, and then we had a couple of small wins, and that was enough for us to win 90. So thanks to Team Ukraine for the, for the very uh, good round. It was challenging, very interesting. Congrats to them. And uh, yeah, this was enough for us to move back to the position number six. So we were still in contention for the podium, but then we learned that due to the fact that Spain already played against a lot of the top teams, <laughs> basically they played against every team that were in front of us. Uh, we were the first team that they didn't play, so they played against us for the last round. So very interesting because we knew that we needed a lot of points to try to aim for the podium. We needed to get something close to a cap against a team that was 
doing very well in the tournament. I think they had five victories or four victories, maybe, and a small defeat. But very strong result display. They were place number one. So we knew that was going to be a very exciting last round. So guys, that's all about this battle report. Thanks a lot for watching. Thanks to my opponent for the game. And talk to you soon on the channel for game number six. Bye.